Good afternoon and welcome to Application Rationalization for a Post-COVID Environment, a Health System CIO Media Inc. production sponsored by LK. Just a little housekeeping. Um, my name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Health System CIO, and I will be your moderator today. We're looking forward to uh, audience particip participation today. You can send in your questions or comments at any time in the Q&A box, and we'll get to those later in the event. Uh, and we'll be throwing out a poll, which will be a lot of fun. We'll have our panelists guess at the poll results, which is a lot of fun. A uh, nice way to view the screen today, if you want to click on the top center and get it in side-by-side -side mode, then you can adjust the divider to get the video boxes in the slide deck the size you want them, and it should say speaker view in the top right-hand corner. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, first we're going to go, go about 35, 40 minutes with our main panel discussion fe featuring Nick Zemanski, VP and CIO at Signature Healthcare, Steve Garaya. VP Enterprise CIO at the Westchester Medical Center Health Network, and Mark Probst, CIO with LK. So without any further delay, let's jump right in. we got a lot of important and good things to talk about, so we're going to get right in there. Um, can we get an overview of your organization and role? Steve, can you, uh, can you go first, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Anthony. Hi, everyone. It's Steve Garaya here. I'm the... Enterprise CIO for WMC Health. WMC Health is a 10 hospital system in the Hudson Valley, New York. Um, most of our hospitals are currently stable. Some hospitals in Epic, some going through a major CERN or migration right now. Trying to pull off a go live in about five weeks. Uh, very interesting time here. I'm looking forward to the conversation and happy to be here. All right, very good. Uh, Nick? Yep. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks, Anthony. Um, so my name is Nick Szymanski. I currently just moved to a role uh, in the Boston area uh, for Signature Healthcare. Uh, the hospital itself is about 220 beds, uh, all the main service lines, uh, including sports medicine. We have a medical group that employs about 160 uh, physicians, and we have, um, you know, some partnerships with uh, Beth uh, Israel. And uh, much like uh, Steve, we're going through a major EMR migration um, and conversion, which is set to go live next week. So uh, very interesting times here as well. Well, thank you uh, both for taking the time out of Go Lives uh, to be with us. Appreciate it. Mark? Yeah, hi, I'm Mark Brooks, and I am the, and this is new, new for me. I'm the CIO at LK. Um, and LK, the tagline for LK is uh, Data Plumbers. And really very focused on data, data integration, data archiving, um, a lot of innovation around tools that can be used to, to support organizations, labs, uh, providers, you know, health systems with data and data management. Prior to this, I was the chief information officer at Intermountain Healthcare, which I am way more comfortable in introducing after spending 17 years there. <laughs> uh, and, and if I answer we sometimes, we still might mean Intermountain, uh, even though I'm not part of we anymore. But uh, it's an honor to be here. Thanks, Anthony. All right. So when we hear we, we'll have to try and clarify. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very good. Very good. All right, Nick, let's start with you. How severe is the problem of application overload, uh, and why does it happen? I don't know if we need to define application overload, or that's pretty obvious, but uh, your thoughts? Um. Yeah, I think it differs from uh, place to place. I think we'd all agree that there is uh, always a certain level of application overload. And I think that can mean some, you know, different uh, meetings to different people. Application overload could be, you know, from IT perspective, how many are we supporting? Uh, application overload could potentially mean how many redundant systems do we have that are serving a very niche purpose uh, within the organization? Uh, so, you know, depending on how you're looking at it, uh, it could mean different things, but I think ultimately uh, just getting a better understanding of what you have and, you know, breaking down the silos of where those applications can be and who's supporting them and what their main function is uh, will help reduce that application uh, overload and, and burden. So when I hear that term, you know, I, I kind of combine those two meanings 
together. And I would say here for me, uh, obviously I, I'm new in the role at this uh, organization uh, and during quite an interesting time. And I know we'll get into it later, but, you know, spinning up applications to help support COVID related issues or, you know, uh, try to put efficiencies in place could have either helped uh, the application overload or could have, um, you know, actually added to it. In some cases, it's done both. Um, so when I hear that phrase, that that's how I I approach it and, and think about it. Mark, what do you think? Um, well, I think the problem. Um, well, I think the environment of application overload is very real and very large, um, and it has to do with the complexity of our industry. You know, we, we do so many different functions within healthcare, everything from hospitality and basically running hotels with very unique um, services around those hotels to very detailed and important um, management of clinical care processes. And those clinical care processes are changing even more quickly than the technology that's supporting them. So, you know, you're, we're in an environment that, um, until 15 years ago maybe was way underserved by technology and then the realization came that the only way this industry would survive would be to get really automated and so a lot of new applications were brought in and a lot of new things are happening very very quickly and this challenge around uh, application whether it's overload or you know adding more applications into our environment is just going to get even more um, challenging as we get into digital healthcare and we start taking people from, you know, uh, we've been automating legacy processes for a long, long time. It got us to where we are. Now, now we're at automating new processes and new ways of providing care. And I think that's only going to add to the challenge that we have. So yeah, it's a, it's a real issue that we should be talking about. Very good, Steve. I agree with um, Nick and Mark that it's definitely a problem, but it di differs from organization to organization. And in my current role, we're going through, we actually went through this process for the past three years and realizing a health system that's been functioning with an, uh, various different levels of maturity over different system, it was absolutely a nightmare. And we're trying to get there by rationalization process and understanding what application really matters, but looking at what we had and what uh, we, we, we're we trying to get to, it was a significant problem. But the problem does exist and why I see you have a why does it happen? I, I'm going to touch on that for a bit. I think it happens as there was no governance in place. There was no strategic alignment in place. A department or a service line would want an application and they would be allowed to bring it in even though it did not align strategically or there was no governance processes in place to really evaluate the application to see how it can be done more effectively. Thus, did we have an application that served that function? Are you having a duplicate application? So there, there, it's definitely a problem, but I don't see it being so much of a problem going forward if you have the appropriate processes in place and a governance structure that really looks at it and make, it sure, make sure that it's strategically aligned to serve a business process that go, going forward. Right, Steve. So you can't, you can't have those one-off buys, those departmental level buys that, do, that, that don't go through sort of a centralized IT governance process and filter that makes sure it's not redundant and that it's necessary, correct? Right, absolutely. And that, that's the key that, you know, to solve the problem. And I, I agree with you that prior to me getting here or prior to others, getting to different organization and establishing an appropriate governance process, the, the, this was rampant. Everybody who wanted something went to someone that knew somebody and got it approved and implemented it. And not having the proper structure in place and not changing the processes, will, it will continue until you have someone that comes in and you know is able to bring everybody to the table to really review what the needs are and see what we have. Do we have something that can really solve your problem? Do we, do we need to work with an existing vendor that has a solution that we can uh, work with them to build for you or maybe has a product we haven't implemented rather than going somewhere else to buy a product? So yeah, absolutely. Hey, Steve and Mark, I, I'm just wondering, and I absolutely 
agree. I mean, governance is so important to what we do and it's historically not been done super well. Um, I think within uh, our industry, I mean, there's, there's really good best practices, but m my question is in, in this topic is um, there, it feels to me like more and more um, opportunity is being given to the business because they're becoming more and more sophisticated in their understanding of technology to bring technology in. And, and I, I don't know, I, I think there's going to be this, this, this tension between governance and things that have, has historically made information systems the, um, the department of no, um, and the, the need for all these really important technologies that need to be brought into the organization. And I, I, I'm not sure how we're gonna feather those two things together in the short term. So that's a, a great question, Mark, and that's a passion of mine really not being the department of no and really becoming a partner to the physicians, the clinic, clinicians, and the, the administrative leaders, really partner with them to fully understand what they're wanting to do, what they're trying to accomplish, and use technology to drive that. That in itself is driving digital innovation and working with them. So having a seat at the table, really having them may bring you into the fold when they're trying to make that decision, really enable us to guide and help them and make sure that it's the right decision rather than being back in the old days, IT was a system that says, no, we can't do that, no, you can't do that. It's really getting out there, meeting with your leaders, engaging with your leaders, understanding what their needs are, understanding where the organization's strategic goals are, and making sure you're a partner with them and enable them to make the right decision. I think that's the solution. Yeah, and I would add uh, two things to that. I think there's one, making sure that the business owner that we're partnering with really knows what they're trying to achieve. And it wasn't, uh, you know, they weren't, uh, they didn't just get off a, a call with a great, um, you know, sales <laughs> rep and sold them, right. you know, the, the latest <laughs> and greatest and say, you know, we might already have a solution like that. And I, and to me, in my head, this is a second point. We've already started down this path. If you look at even Steve and I mentioned on the, uh, on the opening that we're migrating away from two disparate EMRs into one. I mean, that in itself to me is, reducing the amount of best of breed, you know, solutions that are out there and moving to a unified um, a platform. So I think we're starting there, but we just have to get even, get even more into the weeds and more detailed and really understand what we already have out there. And that's what I meant by uh, breaking down the silos, you know, that already exist uh, within the organization. Yeah, and the role of a CIO becomes more of a relationship management role than a technology role at some point. You got to understand how do you build, manage, and, and enrich the relationship with your end users and, and your leaders so that you are partnering with them. So it, it, the role is changing and you have to have the right mindset to adapt to that as a CIO. Mark, I want to follow up with you on something you said to just make sure I understand you correctly. Are you saying that more freedom and autonomy should be given at the department level so they can be nimble and get what they need? Or, or should, does it still need to roll up, but IT needs to be not the department of no in terms of trying to empower. So where do you stand on that in terms of the autonomy given to actually make purchases? Yeah, I, I think this should maybe a little bit on the horizon, not necessarily today because we are in exactly the environment that Nick and Steve uh, outlined. But over time, we are going to have to be able, well, we're going to have to architect solutions that allow for fairly rapid change of solutions. And whether or not we provide that autonomy or empower our end users, or whether they're just going to take it is going to be an interesting mm -hmm. uh, phenomenon moving forward. Um, because again, you know, 20 years ago, we were the people that taught people how to use a keyboard and mouse, and this is something called a CRT. And they, didn't, they, they just weren't that interested in it. Today, they are incredibly sophisticated. They are technically knowledgeable. And so that I believe the users themselves are going to be key players in the decisions about what technology gets brought in. And there's gonna be finesse, as Steve was saying, in how we keep those relationships and how we keep you know, kind of the cats herded so that we don't get into security problems or data problems that do doesn't match up and doesn't give us the answers that we want. 
but I, I agree that the role is shifting for the CIO um, and that I do think end users are going to have and are going to take a lot more um, responsibility and accountability for bringing systems into our, into our environments. So we got architect solutions that allow that to occur. I think that's fascinating. I think that's a really, really interesting point. And, um, it, you know, the subtlety and the nuance that you're talking about, it, it, you know, we all like, I love black and white, right? What's the process? What's the system? Now we got it. We're set. It all, you know, and what we were talking about, about everything having to go through IT, I get that mentally. You can picture it. It's all got to roll up. Somebody gets to look at it and decides. You're talking about a future that's a lot more subtle, a lot more nuanced because, you know, your comment about them just taking it, um, that's fascinating. That's fascinating if that's a direction we're going in. It it's probably makes CIOs a little nervous to say, well, then we're going to be in even worse shape if they start just buying stuff. So I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that anymore, Nick or, or Steve. Well, yeah, I'll say, I mean, I definitely agree with Mark, I think, but it will also go back to, again, having some uh, sort of uh, structure in place or governance. So you have to find that balance, right? We are holding the relationships and uh, the technology. Um, so you have to, I don't know if we'll ever find that perfect middle ground of between everything comes from IT or everything comes from the end users. We have to find some happy medium, especially if we're going to be expected to support it. Um, so, yeah, it's a it's an answer to be determined on how we get to that point. I think it will vary on the, the players at each table, at each organization, as to where, where that balance is. Yeah, Steve, it sounds like from what Mark's saying, the current structure where, um, and I think COVID showed us that we need to be nimble and fast, right? And IT showed what it could do. So I think that's kind of what Mark is touching on. We need to get into more of that level of speed, and it's hard to do that maybe if everything goes through IT. So, But, Steve, you, can you talk about the pace of expectations, the change in the pace that is expected now after IT showed what it could do, people rolled out telehealth in a week when they thought it would take 18 months. Um, and the whole organization goes, wow, you know, now we know what you could do. You know, it's like my wife, if I, if I show her I know how to do the laundry without screwing it up, I'm going to have to do it. So Steve, your thoughts? Listen, I do the laundry very well. Um, <laughs> I don't separate. I don't believe in separating stuff. I think that's a myth. Anyway, go ahead. No, no, absolutely. But being in the belly of the beast of COVID for, you know, the past couple of months has been much calmer than it was in April, March, April, May. It was a dramatic, dramatic shift in expectations for my end users. And so much so that they are sticking with that. I think it's the mindset of what can be accomplished has changed dramatically. And we have to rise as CIOs to meet that. Yet we did some things during COVID that if you had time, you would not have done and you would have done it slower. You, you would have done it better. You would have thought about security a little more, but you have to get the stuff done on the fly. But that has dramatically changed and shifted expectations. As a CIO, you have to be willing to rise to that occasion and, and balance that. Yes, the expectations are there. Yes, we have to have governance. Yes, we have to have processes. Yes, we have to get the PMO plugged in, but still be able to meet that. I had a request uh, last week, and it was a dramatic thing. In a typical environment, I would have given an ETA about four to six months. I said to them, okay, by next Thursday, we'll have it ready. I scrambled and scrambled and scrambled, and we rolled out a temperature scanning that really was able to identify every employee coming in, load the data into the cloud and they could run reports. And it was a dramatic thing that in prior to COVID, it would have been a project that goes through, goes through the initial, the traditional project life cycle and it would not have been done and we're doing it. And absolutely we have to really change the way we think, try to engage, try to be that trusted advisor, but still meet their expectation. But the key is to manage expectations. They know what we can do. They understand what's possible, but yet we want to do it right. So it's really the CIO's role to get in there, manage their expectation by able to deliver to them what they need, but deliver it to them where it has quality. It's really meeting organizational goals, and that is strategically getting them where they need to get to. But it's a different world, and we, we definitely got to be able to make sure we do it right, but still meet our end users' expectations. 
Well, it's an interesting point, Steve. Uh, you talk about managing expectations. Um, so you want to get out there and tell people genuinely w when they can expect something to be accomplished. What if, as you describe what they can expect, you get feedback of that's not good enough? Well, but that goes back to them seeing you that as a trusted advisor, them having confidence in you. They know what you're saying. They believe and they trust that you, you're, not, you're looking out for their best interests. Mm -hmm. Not having that relationship or not them not seeing you as that trusted advisor does not provide you the, the advantage you would have if they're seeing you as their trusted advisor and their partner. So you, building on what you already have as a CIO, not being a backroom CIO that closed the door and we're going to say no to you, getting out there and engaging your end users, engaging your clinician, building your relationship, delivering for them on time, building the trust with them so you are that trusted advisor that when you speak, they'll listen. They'll understand and have logic to back it up, have facts. And if they trust you, they'll absolutely listen to you. There are times that you have to really fight for what you want. But, again, it's the right thing to do. But sometimes you've got to, you know, hold them back a little bit. But if you're able to establish that trust with them, they'll trust you and they'll, they'll, they'll have the buy-in. And I'll, I'll add to that, too. I think as we speak about the role of the CIO changing, one thing that I often say is that uh, I feel one of the biggest uh, responsibilities I have is to be able to translate. I don't go to the meetings with the rest of the leadership or any uh, meeting and talk tech talk. They don't need to hear it. They don't want to hear it. That's for me to know and that's for us to know. Um, so I need to be able to speak in their terms and understand their terms. And if I can understand clearly or get them to articulate clearly um, what they need and what their true needs are, hopefully we'll eliminate those situations where we're going back to them and saying, hey, I thought I had that covered, but you know, I found out it doesn't work. If, you, if I know we're going to have you know, there's always going to be some situations like that, but you could, I think you can limit that if you, again, to what uh, Steve is saying, if you have the trust and you can truly understand and get them to uh, articulate what they need to accomplish, that's where we're, where being the advisor from the IT side could help uh, hopefully limit those situations. Yeah, Steve, so uh, very interesting what you're saying. Uh, you have to establish that trust and credibility in order to be listened to when you're telling them maybe something they don't want to hear. Uh, but you have to do it the first time because that's how you build the trust. So you have to push back. If, if you know when something can be delivered on the, or the level you can achieve with something, you've just got to fight that fight the first few times develop that credibility. Okay, he said it was going to be in four weeks, and he got it in four weeks. Okay, he knows what he's talking about. So it's a process, like a snowball, correct? And it builds from there? Yeah, it is not something that can happen overnight. Someone coming in now into a new organization trying to establish himself, as Nick is trying to do there, it, it takes a while to build that trust. But it will happen if you consistently deliver on your promises and you're open, upfront, and honest guy. I always believe that if you promise something, you should deliver it. But if you can't, you own up to it. Listen, I can't deliver X and Y date. So here are the reasons why. Mm -hmm. and But I'll make sure it gets done in the future date. But building trust like anything with your wife and your laundry or your kids, <laughs> it takes time. It does, yeah. that, it, it's not an overnight thing. But you as a CIO have to understand that it's a relationship management job more than it is a technology job now. And being that as your goal to understand that you're an honest, upfront guy that's here to help them and make sure that whatever their needs are met, but within reason, and you have your, they have to understand where you're coming from, too. At one point, I wore both hats, a CIO and a CISO, and it was a challenge for me to really convince them, yes, you want to get it done, but let's look at the strategic barriers as well as the security barriers. But they understood that I, I, I'm there for them. I'm there to help them out. I'm there to make sure that, you know, they're able to do the job the best they can using technology in the most efficient manner. And it took me a while to get here, but now, you know, I'm able to engage with them on a completely different level where they're seeing me as a partner versus an IT guy who always says no. So Steve, just to be clear with my kids, I am the department of no. <laughs> Oh, you were supposed to be as parents, right? I think. I actually, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. So I'll, I'll admit that there. Um, all right. Very good. That's some great, uh, a great discussion and great high level stuff for pretty much anything, uh, anything um, we need to deal with. Let's, 
Let's talk a little bit more in, in granular with the specific uh, issue today. So we're talking about rationalizing your application portfolio. Obviously, the thought there is you're going to get it down. You're going to reduce the number of applications you have. Something has to happen with the data that's in the applications you're sunsetting. So once I, applications are identified for sunsetting, then you've got another job to do, right? First, first you've got to find the stuff. You've got to do the inventory, find out what you have. Then you've got to decide what you want out of what you have. And then you've got to move the data, deal with the vendors, the incoming vendor, the outgoing vendor, a company like LK that's going to help you in the middle, uh, that kind of thing. So what are the best methods or some advice for people that are starting to get into this specific process? Mark, why don't you start? Well, I mean, you, you put, put the ball on the tee here, Anthony. I mean, call me. Call LK. <laughs> the best method to get this solved but uh we're not going to be quite that salesy uh, uh -huh. you know I, I really think you have to start with the data itself and you know hopefully because we've all been involved with security today and and the things that we're doing around that we're getting good solid data inventories and i i think a key to this process is to really understanding your data understanding what format you want it in what does it mean how do you get to some level of semantic, in this case, not interoperability, but certainly movement of that data so that you're getting into a format that's ultimately going to be usable to your end users, but also usable for the things you want to do with it, whether that's analytics or uh, AI or whatever the things you want to do with it. So it starts with the data, understanding it, and then, you know, having good processes and methodologies for moving it. The, the more we can depend on standards that are out there to help us do that, data standards, uh, in, integration standards like FHIR, that's going to be useful as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it, it, it really just comes down to really understanding the data, what's going to be useful to you, what do you have to keep, what's got to stay around for seven years, what's got to stay around forever, you know, what can we get rid of because it's just not going to be useful to us moving forward. And then what kind of situations are our end users going to need that data from those sunset applications? Steve? And then call well, as one who just nope. went through that, um, Nick, uh, 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 you, you want to go? No. Yeah. Well, besides calling, besides calling Mark, uh, <laughs> I think what you know, Mark hit on all on on all the the major points. And you know, you to me, the first thing, uh, along with what Mark said, and he highlighted some of this too, is how long do you need that data? Where are people going to be accessing that data? And how you know, what are they going to do with that data? Uh, and until you really flush out all of those, um, or get out all the you know, get those answers. I don't, I don't think we can make a, a really responsible decision because it's, we don't have what we don't have our end game, you know, uh, defined. So I, I wouldn't even know what to consider a success. Is it just moving a data out of moving the data out of a sunsetted application? That's not going to do anything for anyone. So kind of that common theme again of really identifying what is it that we need to achieve and what are we looking to get from it? Uh, you know, until you have all of those answers, then, you know, once you do have those answers, then you can start determining how you're going to move forward. Steve? So I actually just went through this process, and, and I think that looking back now, um, everything that Nick says and Mark says is, is true, but having the right partner to engage with and who knows has done this, who knows it, and really can help you get there. As CIOs, we've, most of us have been through smaller data migrations, but data migration has changed. And I've been through a couple of these, but what we're doing now is phenomenally different from what I've done in the past. And uh, having a partner who knows how to do this, who are really true partners with you, and are able to help you deliver what the expectations of the customers are in a seamless manner and having them be with you side by side throughout the whole process would be the key and I was lucky enough to have found LK I won hymns in Vegas one year and I met the team and somehow we clicked that we brought them in and they've been nothing but phenomenal partners to us they have a phenomenal product they are phenomenal people and they really treat you like you're a partner they are getting here to engage with you to engage with your clinicians they discover exactly where all the data is, what we should do with the data. They partner with you throughout the entire process. 
and they develop a solution for you that they execute flawlessly. So, yes, you have to know what you want. Yes, you know, have to know to execute any project, what the end goal is, and march towards that end goal. You have to be able to have the data available to the clinicians in a seamless manner from within the EMR, simple click. All the data is there, but all the data has to be tied with an EMPI. Yes, we get all that. But I think the key to it is really finding that partner who's really will willing to help you and not just there to execute because you have a contract. Execute and help you in any way you need help because as you start the process and you go through, you'll discover you need other things and, oh, I didn't think of that, I didn't think of that. And these guys never go back to the contract. They're like, oh, no problem, we'll help you. No problem, this is how we do it. So again, LK has been really phenomenal to us and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to them, but knowing that the way they do business and the product that they have, I think it will be key to anyone looking for to do a data, significant data migration. So you mentioned phenomenal people at LK. Are you including Mark? Or uh, I, uh, I have not met Mark. I've not worked with Mark. I've known okay. Mark. All right, I just want to be clear. I think he would, only add, that, he would only add to the team. <laughs> But, you know, they, they have, you know, from AJ to Kamal to Shriya to Sunita, they have an yeah. amazing team. All right. All right. So we'll have to see. It's it's uh, it's up in the air. Yeah. It depends on what Mark does. We'll evaluate him later. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Very okay. good. I was going to um, talk to you about a chair, Steve, but now with that comment, nah, forget it. You got to scroll. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll see my chair. <laughs> Very good. Very good. All right. We're having a little fun here, which is nothing wrong with that. Um, I have heard uh, uh, this type of work described as a security play. There's a huge security element to this, so I think we should discuss it a little bit more. Um, Steve, as a uh, security guy, a former CISO, um, w how would you describe the security angle of this work? Absolutely. It, security plays a key role in any data migration, data movement, data storage. So security does play a role having knowing how the data would be acquired, how the data would be transported, and where the data would be stored. You have to make sure that security is tied into the process every step of the way, understanding what data you're pulling, is it the right data, understand who has access to the data. As the data is being normalized, who's, you know, make sure it's done in a way that meets your security standards. We're a high trust shop, so we have significant uh, processes and security standards that we have to adhere to. And again, finding a partner who understands what you're trying to do, but having your CISO or that I was a CISO at that point, or your security team engage in the process from the beginning to the end, making sure that all the security standards are met, all the security controls, all the risk factors are addressed, it's key, absolutely. Nick? Yeah, so in this case, uh, I would call Steve. And then he would help me out. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, yeah, uh, all the points you touched on are exactly it. Um, and I think, you know, for say like a shop like us, um, as we build, we would have to, uh, and we build our security uh, structure and teams, we would have to depend on, um, you know, someone that has that, that inner knowledge, whether that be the company, if it was LK, say handling the data, um, but also having uh, a resource to help guide you, um, to help, you know, avoid the, the gotchas. Uh, but to what Steve said, it's really just understanding the highest level is just understanding who's accessing the data, how's it being transferred and where, where is it going? Um, but again, having that guidance, especially in my case, uh, is what I would look for, you know, so it's kind of two tracks, you know, who's working on um, the sunsetting and the data migration, but then also have someone that's helping me, uh, you know, walk us through the process as a, uh, you know, uh, security, putting their security goggles on to help us do it in the safest way. So that, that's what I would add to that. Very good. All right. I want to um, open it up for audience questions, but um, as I throw out one of my own questions, um, let me go to Mark first on this. Um, we, you talked about the importance of knowing what you want with, to do with the data, right? So as a CIO, who are the key people that you need to talk to about that? Is it, you know, for whatever the application in, it's the head, might be clinical person or business person, but the, the head person who deals with that data, are those key conversations in terms of finding out from IT to find out what you need to do with the data? Um, 
So it, it really comes, who's using the application today, right? I mean, you could start there. Who is using the application and what are they doing with that application? I don't think it ends there because there are other uses and there's future uses for that data that are gonna be in, uh, important as well. So, you know, I don't think it's as easy as saying, we're gonna go to this person or even this department, but we're gonna look at what, what are the current uses of the system? What are some of the future digital uses for those systems? What are we trying to do around analytics? I would absolutely have my analytics team involved with it to understand what they want to do with the data and what can be done with the data. So it, it, it's almost like an investigative process that one needs to go through to understand the data and then its potential uses. Very good, Nick. Um, yeah, same thing. I don't think it's a, just a unilateral decision as to well, you know, what, what are we going to do uh, with the data once it's moved over? Uh, and I think for our role, and, um, you know, we, we, in our role as a CIO and the, and the technology uh, point person is to think ahead and, and knowing what solutions uh, are just coming out, um, what are people looking at, what we may be able to do with it, um, and then maybe engage those folks that would benefit from it and say, you know, this is going to be available or it could be available. Is that of value to us here? Um, and having that, you know, those discussions. So I, I think it's also being able to, like Mark alluded to, looking ahead of the curve uh, rather than simply just saying, all right, we're taking this data. What do you want to do with it once we move it? Or what data do we need that's critical and then move it? So uh, you know, being ahead of the curve with what, what's coming next, I think, is our key uh, value in those discussions. Steve? I'll look at it a little differently. Those guys are correct, but having the appropriate data governance process in place, understanding who owns the data, who access the data for all your system, and having a process where everybody should be an owner and custodian of the data, but there has to be one person that owns the data and who grants access to that. If you have that process in place where a, a really well-run data governance process is in place and everyone is engaged, you would not have to wonder who should you contact. That would already be established. So for anyone going through this process, thinking you should go through a process, it's a good thing to do. Establish a well-run data governance process to make sure that you know where your data resides, you know who has access to it and who owns it and who the custodian of that data is will enable you when times co time come for you to look at an archive solution, look at moving your data, or anything that relates to your data, it will really help you significantly reduce overhead as you're trying to do that in the, in the planning process because it will all already be a process in place that you just pull out your paper or, or you have a committee and it would be much, much easier to do. Very good. All right. We're going to throw out our audience poll, have a little fun here. Um, I'm going to launch that right now, so please go ahead and answer it. The choices are agree or disagree. The rush to combat COVID-19 exacerbated the application overload problem. Our panelists can vote as well. So you can get into the act. Um, did did the, what IT had to do to help people provide the proper clinical care, um, do we look back now and have to deal with more applications, more tools that we threw out there that maybe didn't get the time and attention and vetting? Uh, maybe we would have had one that was slightly redundant that we could have put them on, but we just had to do what we had to do. So if you want to answer that, um, look at that for a minute, and then we will – um, get back and we'll look at the results and have our panelists guess. Um, I'd like to do the ask a co-panelist while we're on that. Mark, do you have a question for one or both of your co-panelists? Uh, well, we've gone through an awful lot today. Uh, my, my question really comes down to our earlier conversation, whether it's around data, you know, or application rationalization or any of these things. What do you see? Do you see us having an environment that's more simple to, than today, uh, two years from now? Or, or do you think we're going to get increasingly complex environments uh, of applications and data and technology? Steve, why don't you jump in first? So, I, I, hey, thanks, Mark. Great question. Um, I think it's going to get more complex. I think with digital innovation on its horizon and many organizations on its way, the way care is being transformed, led by COVID, I think this is going to be a seismic shift in the speed, but I think the number and diversity of applications that are brought into our environment 
And I think us as CIOs have to be ready for that, has to be prepared for that, has to have the right processes in place and the right mindset to be adaptive to that, but to make sure we do it right. Again, it doesn't matter how many applications, it matters if it's the right application. It matters if the application is functioning the way you need it to function, where it's delivering upon what it's set to deliver. It's integrated, it's really at the end of the day, making patient care more safe and more efficient. So again, the, the you as a CIO have to be ready and be nimble, but yet have processes in place to deal with it to make sure it's done right. But I absolutely see the future is going to get, for lack of a better word, crazier. <laughs> Nick? Yeah, so I uh, completely agree with Steve, and I would say that uh, I think we would all agree that there, this can get more complex as more uh, applications and functionalities are either needed or and or uh, created. What I would say, though, is I would hope that by those uh, vendors or organizations, whatever, I don't know what the appropriate level uh, would be, but to, to all adapt um, similar guidelines, uh, Mark alludes to fire, you know, five, 10 years ago, the data could all, you know, each system could have had its own different structure and we're, you know, slowly moving into, uh, you know, arenas where the data is somewhat similar. Um, you know, so I, I would hope that we would be able to accelerate that path to hope, you know, to help neutralize the complexity of the data itself, you know, when those uh, situations occur, when we are sunsetting data, archiving data. Um, so, yeah, the more applications, you know, obviously are coming, but I would hope that uh, the structure of those, uh, the data behind the applications, uh, you know, will become uniform or close as possible. All right. Very good. So we have got our poll results. Now we're going to have our panelists guess and see who gets the closest. So what percentage agree with this statement? Nick? Well, 100%. Really? 100? Wow. He will not be outdone on the top end there. Steve? <laughs> 98. Just I'm trying to be play prices right. 98. Okay. <laughs> Mark? $1. One dollar. What? 90? Well, I mean, 90. You know, it took 198, so yeah. All really, right. just All right. to have something weird happen. You guys are killing me. Uh, the winner is Mark. Wow. The results are 82% wow. agree. So you got 18% of people think you guys are nuts, um, but 82% uh, think yep. you're you're right on. So I guess that's good. You'll take it, right? All right, let's go back with our remaining time and have our other co-panelists ask a question. Nick, do you have a question for either of your co-panelists? Yeah, I would say uh, I would ask both of uh, the gentlemen. Um, you know, did you guys ever find a, a, or have a good process in place as we talk about application overload? Um, did, you, did you have a formalized process uh, to review the applications uh, and to begin to build uh, a game plan uh, an associated timeline to, to reduce those? Is, was that an annual review of the applications? Who owns it? What's its function? Um, are there new technologies out there that could reduce those three systems into one? Um, have any of you gone through a process like that? Steve? So we we're actually going through that process right now due to our magnitude of our um, EMR implementation. We have looked probably over 350 applications being reduced significantly. And I agree with you, there, there should be a process in place. I, I don't have one, but I'd love to put a process in place after we go live to make sure that we're examining what we have to make sure it's the right application. But going for an all-encompassing system with very few bolt-ons now, that becomes a simpler task. But there are still applications that are left that someone was tied to or for some other business reasons were left behind and are still integrated. And absolutely, we should focus on that and see if there's a way to get it integrated because having an integrated system, there's numerous benefits towards that. So a great, great, great question. Uh, and I think going forward, you definitely would benefit by having such processes in place. Mark? So, yeah, we definitely, this would be the past we at Intermountain Healthcare had processes for looking at this on an annual basis. We would price out what the savings would be to the organization. Um, it went on steroids when we made a very aggressive strategy to move our applications to the cloud. 
because why move it if it's not going to be useful? And I got to tell you, Nick, we sucked at it. I mean, we, <laughs> we really, we had good processes in place, but again, it, with all the different priorities that came up, whether it was an EMR implementation or you know some of the other technical strategies that we had going on, um, this did not take a high priority. And, and it was real dollars. I mean, it was millions of dollars in savings if we could achieve it, but keeping the uh, organization focused on that uh, was pretty challenging. So I think you're right on in what you're trying to do, Nick, and what you're asking. Um, but it, you know, it isn't a primrose path. It's, it, it was a difficult process that we, we had a hard time, you know, sustaining. Very good. Uh, Steve, do you have a question for your co-panelists? Yeah, I'll ask both of these guys. Um, how do you think COVID has shifted the role of a CIO? And how can that CIO adapt to the changing world and the urgency that's upon us now? Uh, Mark, you want to go first? You know, um, I think it has moved the CIO up, the, up a few notches on the ladder because it's really shown how important um, not just that person is or that role is, although I think those are real, but how important that whole department is. And, you know, one of the interesting, and, and I could go on for a long time on this and I won't, but one of the interesting thing was when COVID first came out, we all created these command centers, you know, where we brought everyone together and we'd talk every morning and throughout the day on the things that we were gonna do. And it was kind of an unnatural thing for most of the operations within the business. But for IS, because just because of our history and how we've had to do things and how we solve inter, you know, in, enterprise-wide problems that are very, very complex, it was just natural for us to create a command center and, and to get going. So um, again, I think it's shown the importance of the role of information systems within our organizations. And, it is, and it's an opportunity now I think for CIOs to take a more um, important role within the leadership of the organization. Nick? Yep, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. I always talk about having a seat at the table um, and this really provided that opportunity and, and we needed to be there. Um, what I think it did do, uh, and this is the earlier point, Steve, and we all agree on this is it really allowed us the opportunity to build those relationships with the rest of the leadership team to show our value, right? Um, a lot of times IT can get left to, uh, you know, be one of the last steps to be notified that something is being implemented and we need it tomorrow and then we're scrambling. Whereas we were getting this in real time and we got to flex our muscles a little bit and show what tools we had and saying, okay, now you're telling me up front because we're all talking about this together. I have a solution that we could do in two days or, hey guys, we already have something. Um, you know, this is what it can do, it, you know, would we be able to achieve what we're trying to, you know, go after here? So I think, uh, you know, to add on and add a, a different angle to what Mark said, it, it really forced the rest of leadership um, to bring us to the table and bring us to the discussion sooner. Uh, and again, allowed us to show what capabilities and show the value of what IT is. It, it should be looked at as the equivalent the organization, especially in healthcare. And when this all hit and how, fast we had to scale up a million different things and implement a different, you know, a million different things and do it well, um, that the value there was immense. So it gave us a great platform to, you know, like uh, Mark said, move up a few pegs. Well, we're almost out of time, Mark. I, I want to give you an opportunity for, for any last words for the IT executives on the line today. Um, probably having to grapple with getting expenses down, right? I mean, that's one of the motivations uh, to do this, right? We know there's a cash crunch with all the electives canceled and the preventatives canceled. Organizations are having a cash crunch. That's filtered through to IT. One of the ways to get your budget under control or to reduce it is to stop paying for what you don't really need anymore, thus application rationalization, moving the data. Um, any advice to our CIO folks listening to this event and feeling the strain of having to tackle what sounds like could be a formidable challenge. I, you know, um, when I, I announced I was going to retire a year ago and I retired in July and the, 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 the biggest, um, 
kind of uh, weight on my shoulders as I retired was I was leaving at a time of, of incredible difficulty for uh, executives in health systems, including CIOs, and maybe most, not mostly, but certainly on the shoulders of CIOs. And I just felt bad, you know, I, I hadn't planned it this way. No one knew COVID was gonna come when I made that decision, but it turned out that that happened. I think CIOs have a very difficult role moving forward because the only way health systems are gonna get out of this mess is to not double down necessarily, but certainly mentally double down and certainly invest more in information technology to, to dig out of the hole that we're in and to really take advantage of what's out there and what's possible for health systems to not just survive, but thrive. Um, but we're going to be asked to cut and I, and mm -hmm. that's going to, it's just going to be an interesting challenge. The, some of the easy money is what we're talking about today. If we could get focused as an industry on, on reducing many of the applications that are there, you know, some of them are needed, but they're needed not very much, right? And some of them are, are not needed at all. And so if we can get through that and start doing some of the right rationalization, turn those things off, not be dependent on all the hardware, the security, all the things that surround it. I mean, an application has so many costs around it. Um, I think we can bring cost savings to the organization without having to reduce our capabilities moving forward to advance the, uh, the organization. So, um, you know, kudos, kudos to these two young guys, um, Steve and Nick. I mean, you guys are the future of what we're doing and, and kudos for what you're doing, the way you're thinking about it. And I thought your comments today were just right, spot on. So I don't know, that's it, Anthony. All right, I'm sure there was kudos for me too in there somewhere you just forgot. I did. I forgot. That's okay. Yeah, that's no problem. <laughs> all right. That's about, that's about all we had time for today regarding continuing education. You could use the final slide in this deck. You'll get an email when the on-demand recording is ready, and you could reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team if you want to sponsor an event with us or go to our website to register for upcoming events. And I know LK's uh, got another one up there, so check that out. Um, with that, I want to thank our panel very much, Steve Garaya, Nick Zemanski, my good friend Mark Probst, uh, LK for sponsoring this event and making it possible, and thank you, our attendees, for joining us. And with that, everybody, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.